It's August 17th, 2020. This is Rook. talk a lot about giving back in these days of global inequality, helping out the less fortunate, doing a good deed, or paying it forward, as they say. But we usually don't define giving back as entirely uprooting life as we know it to dedicate ourselves to those in need. Today I'm joined by Shahla Etifak, or Mother Miracle as she's also known, an Iranian-American woman who made a fateful decision 25 years ago to give up all her many material possessions, move to India in order to build a school for children in need. Two decades later, Mother Miracle has affected thousands of lives. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Welcome to episode number 36 of Rok Khoshomadin. Hi there. Hope you're doing okay out there. Hi, Shia. Hi, Shia Jun. Hello, Zian. Groovy Shia. How are you? Uh, I'm all right. I have a tickle in my throat. Oh. Do you know that expression? Um, I knew the expression under the weather, but... That's right. <laughs> but a tickle in your throat is like you feel like you've... It's sort of like under the weather, but it's a, you feel like something might be coming on in your throat. Oh. Yeah. And you sure that it's not corona? <laughs> <laughs> I like how that's the only option. <laughs> I am not sure uh, as it turns out. Maybe I uh, but I don't have any of the predominant uh, sy- symptoms at all. Uh, at least not yet. As I recently test and it was negative, so I think you Oh, you know, did. You, no, my roommate did. <laughs> oh, so you didn't. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean. But no. that's good. Yes. I am most interested in getting to our uh, very spiritual, almost angelic guest today who has done so much for the children of Rishikesh, India. Shaya uh, Shahla Etifal, Mother Miracle, will join us in a few moments. Uh, first things first, though, a bit of a mea culpa. Uh, at the top of the last show, uh, you know, our last show featuring NASA director extraordinaire yes, Shiraz's favorite son, Firuz Nadiri. Uh, I said it's August 23rd, 2020. And and now, four days later, uh, it, it's still not August 23rd. It's uh, It was actually August 13th. And I messed up. Okay, of course. Here comes that, Captain right? Reza. Oh, I'm sorry to cut the show. <laughs> Gian Gamashi. How long have you been in broadcasting now? The master of Gomeshi, Gomeshi, yeah, 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 master of voices, the maestro of uh, <laughs> the uh, maestro interviewing. Of <laughs> August twenty third. I, huh? I I made a mistake. <laughs> you know, I was yeah. actually going to say. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say that uh, I did it on purpose to see who who would notice. Yeah. Then some and people noticed. Oh, <laughs> it seems like that, a bad idea. The worst part of it, actually, the worst part of it was. Uh, was Firuz Nadiri, I mean, I hold him in this elevated place in my mind. You know, he's this, uh, he's iconic in our community and he's done such great things. He sent me a note after the interview and I was like a, I was like a little schoolgirl. I was like, oh, Firuz Nadiri sent me a note. He said he loved the interview. He thought it was great. You're a great interviewer, all that. So I was feeling so good about it. And then afterwards, I was thinking he's probably listening back and going, this guy doesn't even know what the date is. I mean, he's like an astronaut, right? Or whatever. He had a Mars mission. He They have to get the dates right, you know? So he probably thinks I'm a fool. Or no. Or maybe he knows that you were so excited that you probably got the dates. I, yeah. I'm, I, was, I was so into his futuristic <laughs> ideas yes. that I leapt 10 days into the future and said August 23rd. That being said, and sorry to interrupt the show, I usually am not on Monday shows, but right. I had to give a shout out to a couple of our very, very hardcore fans who noticed that from the top of the show and mentioned it to us, reached out to us. Yeah. 
And uh, I, I don't think it was just our hardcore fans, by the way, because <laughs> yeah. everybody I run into is like, by the way, you know, it's not August 23rd. Right. And so, you know, well, but I was fun. thinking it'll be great when it is August 23rd, because that'll be a fresh episode. We can re-release it. <laughs> But it was Morda 23rd, I think. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, thank you, Captain Reza, for running in, as you heard us talking about this, to Raz me. I Very, very <laughs> kind of you. Uh, second, I want to mention that um, in the coming days on Rook, uh, Abbas Milani will be joining us for a special feature of the, the great academic writer, yes. uh, um, Stanford prof, head of the Iranian Studies Department there. Uh, Abbas Milani will be joining us. Uh, this is going to be a special episode on reflections about the Pahlavi dynasty on uh, on the 40th anniversary summer this, uh, this summer of the passing of the Shah of Iran in exile. Um, we talked about the fact that we're going to have a few different historians and and uh, uh, experts uh, talking on this subject. Abbas Milani will be joining me in the coming days on Rook to discuss that. On different platforms, by the way, I'm still hearing from people mm-hmm. who say, Shia, they they say like, uh, uh, your show's great. Have you thought of putting it on Spotify? You know, I'm like we're on Spotify. Yes. Yeah. And SoundCloud. Yes. And iTunes. And they'll say, oh, you guys should start an Instagram account. And I'm like, we have an Instagram account at Rook Media. <laughs> yes. So it's not just, I mean, I I think, I can't, I can't remember. I think the majority or or a, a, a good percentage of people consume this on YouTube, on our YouTube oh. channel. But there's a whole bunch of people listening on SoundCloud, including those who are listening from Iran. Yes. Or on SoundCloud, and then there's uh, Spotify and iTunes and and uh, Instagram. You can listen to the show. Me on personally, I listen to rock on Spotify. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Why is that? Um, I like Spotify, and it's. F- I guess that's self-evident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does it, I don't think it sounds any different though. No. I listen on SoundCloud, but I look at the YouTube to make sure that uh, we get everything right, like the date off yeah. the top of the show. <laughs> uh, finally, before we get to Shahla et Tefal, I wanted to say a, a special word of thanks and recognition, Shaya, for Arash Behzadi. Arash Behzadi, originally from Iran, you may know him as a uh, sublime musical artist, a piano player, composer. Yeah. Collaborator. Second episode of Rock, actually, we played. We played a song of his. That's right. He has, um, I mean, he's performed around the world and has amassed an international following for his very beautiful and spiritual way with the piano and the music he makes. Arash is also, what you may not know, an entrepreneur who has built a very successful company from scratch outside of his music and someone who gives back to the community. And uh, so he is supporting Rook for a few episodes and and we are very grateful um but there's also some actual special synergy with Arash Besani and our feature guest today because Shahla Atifag lives uh for much of the year in Rishikesh India mm-hmm. and that place is renowned as a place for studying yoga and meditation and I don't know if you know this Shaya but Arash Besladi is, is the pioneer in something called piano yoga. Ooh. So he he plays intuitive kind of piano, like it's all improvisation and energy based, which he gets off the the people who are doing the yoga and the instructor during yoga classes. And he's done this at festivals with thousands wow. of people doing yoga. So he's done this around the world in Bali and Dubai and Canada and Turkey and Italy and the US. He is a yogi himself. And so he says you can take people to a deeper place in the yoga practice with with music, piano, with the piano music. Wow. Yeah. Um, anyway, Arash has a new album coming out, uh, I think, in the coming days. And you can check him out on Instagram at Arash Piano. It's as simple as that, A-R-A-S-H, Arash Piano. Thank you again to Arash for all you do with your music and for supporting Iranian culture in the diaspora and for supporting Rook. Okay. So let's get to Mother Miracle. You know, most of us who've been on the planet for a few years learn life can take 
unexpected turns and turbulence that spawns from the ebbs and flows can be a sign that we are on the wrong path. For some, this can lead to dark places and destructive behavior, but dark turns can also result in candid reevaluation and subsequent changes to our life and a shift in our path, a path that can bring a sense of ease and serenity where things just seem to fall into place and work out as they should. And in turn, this ease may seem like it's born from a series of lucky coincidences or even miracles. And maybe it is. Our guest today, Mother Miracle, is an educationist who moved from a high-end material life in California to Rishikesh, India, to set up a school for many of the town's poorest children, a path that has had a profound effect on so many lives. Shahla Etifal is the president and founder of the Mother Miracle organization. She actually holds a master's degree in architecture, but Shahla moved to India in 2002 with the mission of providing opportunity for extremely impoverished children through education, empowerment, and unconditional love. Shahla has not only transformed the most underprivileged children from Rishikesh's shanty areas into academic stars and sport champions, she has also inspired a remarkable change in the social and economic fabric of that region. Today, 522 students from kindergarten to the 12th grade are enrolled in the Mother Miracle School. More than just an educational institute, the school not only provides all the necessary learning supplies, but also provides food for all the students and the 33 staff members and their families, feeding 2,220 people in total every day. Shahla Etifal has received numerous awards for her interesting journey, including the Indian Solidarity Council Award in 2015, the Global Achievers Foundation Award in 2017, and the Mahatma Gandhi Saman Award presented at the House of Commons London in 2018. This year, Shahla is nominated to receive the Ellis Island Medal of Honor presented at Ellis Island, New York. But first, right now, Shahla Etifar joins us from San Francisco today. Hello. Hi. <laughs> it's quite, why are you laughing? Um, <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited too. I mean, you deserve that introduction. You, you, your journey is remarkable. Uh, it is most fortuitous to have this chance to talk to you. You are in San Francisco right now. I imagine you spend most of your time in India these days. How does it feel when you are away from Rishikesh now and all of your kids there? Actually, I'm maybe physically away, but in my heart, I'm with them every moment. I wake up with them, I work for them, I fundraise for them, I'm called there every day and talk to my assistant, talk to my staff, and Zoom. <laughs> Doesn't sound like you're ever too far from Rishikesh. Yes, that's true. You know, this is a strange question to ask someone who spent so many years uh, in the United States, if not in, a, in, in the modern part of Iran, uh, the way you lived your life. But do you experience actually a need for cultural adjustment each time you return to Western life from Rishikesh? Uh, yeah, it's a very mind-blowing when I come from a little village to San Francisco and in see the abundance and see the speed of life and yeah it's quite adjusting every time i come back <laughs> well i guess i want to get into that let me get into the speed of life and abundance as you've talked about but first things first i want people to hear your remarkable story shahla before anything else this started in december of 1995 as the story goes you traveled to india as a tourist at that time with a group of friends what happened on that trip what did you see that so moved you to change the path of your life and begin your journey towards mother miracle well my journey started in december 1995 you know traveling in India with a bunch of friends as a tourist in a group of friends. We were in the car driving in zero degree freezing winter in the state of Bihar. And we were traveling from Varanasi to Bodh Gaya, which is a Buddhist site. So uh, in that uh, trip, I was sitting in a car 
and looking outside of the window and I saw family living in hot made of plastic, teeny mother milking their newborn baby and children were all scavenging into the garbage and, and find something to eat or even to sell. So those scene was like, I was like shocked looking through the window to this poverty. Right. And I was complaining nonstop about the rotten garbage, urine smell, <laughs> car horning. And so the, when we got to the uh, point that the driver and the people said, oh, let's stop for a chai. So we stopped at a stall and I was sitting there across this garbage dump site. It was winter and it was very cold. And I remember I had a black Eddie Bowery down ski suit with the matching hat and gloves and enjoying my cup of tea. Right. And the door opened and a, a little three years old girl and she came straight to me and she pointed to my chai. So I gave her the chai and then she sat next to my leg and uh, hold on to my leg to, to, to warm up. And I just bent down and uh, uh, hug her in my arms to to give him a little bit of the warmth of my body to her and as she was in my arms I entered in a tunnel at the end of the it was just the imaginary tunnel and the end of the tunnel was this bright light uh, and I saw in this tunnel my entire privileged life. Um, I'm sorry, I always get emotional. That's okay. And it flashes before my eyes. And I saw the image of this uh, uh, I saw myself skiing in Gestad. I was say, saw myself yachting in Nice, shopping and I saw my three-story house in United States, and I saw all my closet were full of clothes that I didn't even had time to wear them, and tag was hanging from them. And while holding her in my arms, I was thinking, why should someone like me have so much money to waste and why, why this child is shivering in my arms from being so cold and a warm and she wants to warm herself with the cup of tea. So that was the moment that I absolutely shifted and I started crying the whole trip. Hmm. <laughs> Did you did you feel like I mean it sounds the way you talk about it now it's as if it was a kind of universe intervention uh did it feel like that then too did you know what was going on did you know that this was going to be a a, a paradigm shift for you uh not at that moment but I just felt that I I, I have changed I felt that oh things are different now I didn't hear the sound of the car and I didn't smell it in garbage. Something uh, major changed within me and the tears of happiness that I changed and it just, the tears just melted me into the culture of Mother India and into the warm and loving arms it's i mean there's so many amazing things about this story one of them is that there's no particular reason for you to have this connection you know you're you're a girl who grew up in iran you've been uh, living in the united states uh you're not particularly uh, there's no there's no previous attachment to india and yet we hear these stories of people really finding their place, this this awakening where you realize where you belong. It sounds like it was that kind of moment. Uh, exactly. I, I was just a tourist, just complaining. 
and thinking, why did I come to India? This is this is full of flies and mosquitoes. But I didn't know I came to India to be transformed by this little girl in my arms. What happens when you return to the United States at the end of that trip? My lifestyle changed. I become vegetarian. I got into meditation and yoga and I couldn't shop. It was just like everything I want to buy, I have to think about it. Do I really need it? And that girl was always in my mind every moment. And I said, I will go back someday to India and I will serve this girl, especially the abandoned girls. So that was in my mind the whole time. But I had, I'm a single mom, so I had my son has to go to college and then finish and graduate. And, you know, just I had some responsibility. And I never forget what I saw in India, not even a moment. Let me take this step by step because I'm, I'm curious. Um, we, we've heard stories like this before. I, uh, in a nutshell, I don't minimize it, but, you know, I gave away my possessions and I moved to Bali or, you know, something. Uh, but I, I'm curious about what actually happens. You know, you, you talk about the lifestyle you had, uh, a luxurious life of skiing and yachts and shopping in Paris and, and your three-story, four-bedroom house with four walk-in closets and designer clothes. Uh, it's one thing to give all of that up or to, or to have a distaste for that kind of materialism based on what you've seen. But you also stop drinking alcohol. You become a vegetarian. You become a Buddhist. That's a seismic shift. Did the change need to be that fundamental, that profound, for you to somehow um, feel okay with yourself, if you will? A very good question. This, this were not my decision. It just evolve in me i couldn't eat when you come from india and you see why they are not eating animal you understand why you know i got it so it just evolved in me so i couldn't party and drink alcohol because it just take me to some other dimension that i was not supposed to be there and i was just not enjoying anymore so slowly I was evolving without even making the decision. You know, sometimes you decide, oh, from tomorrow I'm not going to drink alcohol or I will be next Monday be vegetarian. It was not like that. My body couldn't absorb any alcohol. My, my, I couldn't look at the meat, you know, just looking at the animal. I feel the mother, a cow, the child, you know, some, some things go to my mind that just it couldn't be the same. Shala, what were people around you saying at this time? What were your, what were your kids saying? What were your family saying? What were your friends saying? I mean, I'm, I'm sure some of them thought that you're you're probably just having a moment, or or <laughs> or questioned uh, how you were changing in front of their eyes. What what kind of response did you get initially? You know, I had a very beautiful. Uh, luxurious life and uh, whenever I said oh someday I will go India and help the poor children and take them out of the poverty and do whatever I can uh, they will always said oh this is one of her phases she will go through she will you know get over it and that time I had a very successful uh, interior art business and they told oh she will never give that up and I was also in love and I said, oh, how can she, you know, live her life, love of her life and go? So they, nobody believed me. Well, I mean, when you look at it 20 years hence, you've, uh, since you've built this school, since you've been spending this time in Rishikesh, I mean, uh, it, it is evidence that what you were feeling was real, was true and, and resolute. It, I think about that moment with that girl. You know, the orthodoxy would be to think a compassionate person would would say would the first thought would be, okay, let me somehow adopt this girl, bring her back to my privileged Western life, and give her a life there. Uh, it seemed like it was never an option for you. Your the option for you was for you to go to her to end up moving to Rishikesh. Tell me about that. Exactly. So. Seven years passed, I never ever forget one minute of that beautiful eyes. And it was 2002, 
that I um, finally got to the point that I said, I this is a this is a time I have to choose either expand my stay here, expand my job, and marry this man and have a different lifestyle, or just leave and go to India and start. So that's when I just got crazy. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and left. So you mentioned this man a couple of times. The, the the person you were in love with. What were the conversations with him like? Well, he was very surprised because he knew I told him I'm going to go to India, but he thought that our relationship is going forward and it's getting to the point that you know. Maybe if he get more serious, I will stay. It was hard for him to believe that, yes, really, I am packing and leaving. And I put my house for sale and uh, I start selling my clothes and shoes and uh, all belonging. And I ripped all my uh, photo album and all my love letter of my life, everything. I just destroyed everything I had. And as he was watching what I'm doing, he just keep believing, oh, really, she's leaving. <laughs> this is serious. So wait a minute. Why? I, I understand the part about selling your clothes, giving away your possessions, saying goodbye to your son, your family, your friends, even the love life. Tell me about the philosophy behind ripping up the photo albums and the love letters, because that seems like it's a year zero that you want it you it's you 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 almost don't want to remember the past or you want to why why have to rip up the photo albums uh you know i look at those photo album and every photo remind me of my past that you know the weeks i had on the party i was going the trips i were going my you know people in my life and past and and I just didn't want to have anything. I just want to just have a, a clear, uh, no no color on the palette, and hmm. start fresh. And I believe that even when I was selling my forks and knife, my uh, sister Mariam, she told me that, why are you selling your forks and knife? You're going to come back here, you're going to have an apartment or some little room, and then you need forks and knife. I said, look, these forks and knife also have memory. When I look at them, I remember all the parties, all the you know dinner party that I served with this forks and knife. Again, if you hadn't gone and built this uh, incredible school, and we're going to get to this, but uh, um, and the, the work that you do uh, around building that region, around helping impoverished people, it would seem like a whimsical story of a well-off Persian kid, you know, living in California who who decides to become a hippie or something. Uh, in the hindsight, we see how again how how resolute you must have been in those moments, in those initial years before you actually do leave and go to Rishikesh. Were there times when you just thought, "What am I doing? What did I just rip up the photo albums for? Those were my favorite shoes." Or did you always know this was the right path? It didn't even any second when doubt in my mind that I'm I'm in a very right path. I just was going and was just destroying my back stories and I was going entering to a new paradigm so I have to take this shift this was a big deal for me so by selling my house and and having everything in one suitcase and and enter to Rishikesh it was like just like I knew this is the right way to do it Okay, I want to pause here and, and and briefly and come back to your experience in Rishikesh and the nature of the school and how it's funded. But first, uh, it, it might be instructive to learn more about you. How who is this person who then become who can have this paradigm shift and turn into Mother Miracle? Take take me back to growing up in Iran, Shahla. How would you characterize your childhood? Well, I was raised. In Tehran, I was fortunate to be born in a very, very wealthy family. And my mother 
came from very religious background and she did not have much education other than five years um, schooling and then uh, she got married very early age and and she was always encouraging me and raising me that you are going to be a very educated girl, very successful girl. You can do whatever you can and nothing will stop you. Make a dream and all your dream will come true. And she was really behind me. Even today, whenever I want to do something, her voice is always in my head, just encouraging me. You can do whatever you can. You just Mm. do it. You never let go of your a vision and just keep going forward. Don't listen to anyone. Just keep going forward and you will get it at the end. So that was very important to have such a phenomenal uh, mother in my life. And of course, my father was a provider. We, it was a time of my life. I had a beautiful apartment. My father got, got for our, his children one in Paris, one in London, one in Germany, one in um, San Francisco, one in Palm Springs. So I just jet setting between these places. So, hmm. uh, and and I was very very few women in my family of their side that they were working. But I remember my mother always said, "You will be educated, and you will be working on your own, and you will make your own money. You don't need anyone." So I graduated with honorary from University of Tehran in architecture. So I came to San Francisco. I went to University of San Francisco. I studied sociology. I also graduated with honorary. So I was always very good student and very achiever, you know. <laughs> Why did you uh, tell me? Uh, I mean, it sounds like you had a, a pretty comfortable life. Tell me about the decision to leave Iran. Was that prescribed did you know that you were not not going to return to iran or was that just a also whimsical at that time to sort of say okay well i'll do some schooling in california and then return to iran i was living in tehran and i uh, came to a trip to europe and i was in paris and i after one month i wanted to come back and then i couldn't come back and i uh, got a call from my dad and he said uh, just stay there and i'm coming to europe so i'll meet you in london so he came to london and um, so i stayed and he said uh, he wants to just stay in europe and he bought a beautiful flat and my sister was there also so we all stay in london and that we never go back and at that, that time i was divorced so my uh, family of my husband uh, was taking care of my son and uh, my mother-in-law told me that think about your son and and stay there if you can and i will bring your son to you whenever you call for it that was one of the reason also i thought well i stay my family are here my father sister and yeah, and I moved without making decision. <laughs> you know, having learned about you, uh, heard about you, uh, and now in the last uh, week researched you uh, as Mother Miracle, it is, um, it's so interesting to me to hear about the life you had before this because all I know is, is the Mother Miracle, Shahla. Um, I, I hear that for some years in the 1970s and 80s when you were in the United States, you ended up co-founding and managing a nightclub. Is that, is that, is that true? <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. What yes. what what kind of a night was it? A, like <laughs> like a disco? <laughs> what? Yeah, I just when I came to US, I just wanted to have a disco. So I asked my dad that please invest so much money in property. Why not you buy property? And I want to open the biggest disco <laughs> <laughs> in the West Coast. Right. <laughs> I'm laughing, but those. I was serious about it. I was nagging him all the time. And my father said, look, I get up every morning. I pray five times a day. 
I'm not going to open a disco. I'm not investing in disco. And I'm not selling alcohol because we didn't drink alcohol even at home. So it was like, no way. And I just want to have a disco. So I met a Chinese guy in the wedding. I didn't know who he is. So he stayed by me the whole night. And then he asked my phone number. So I gave him my phone number. So we talk about it. Next day, we had a lunch together. And then he asked me, what is your dream? And I told him, I said, well, I want to have a you know, nightclub. And my dad don't let me do it. He has the money, but he doesn't invest. So not knowing that guy is one very wealthy Chinese. So he uh, invited to the dinner. After dinner, he drove me to the this building in the south of Market, huge building. And he showed me the building. He said, well, what about I give you this uh, four-story building and you build your club here with me? And I'm like, wow. And I designed it. I... Uh, put all my idea behind it and I become the most successful club uh, in whole west coast of California. Sorry, but you must have been and you could see some charming <laughs> person that random <laughs> everyone wants yeah. to give you things including <laughs> nightclubs. Men are offering you nightclubs uh, because you decided you liked it. By the way, running a night- nightclub is not easy. This this is the, it's oh, a serious yeah. business, and right? You, yeah, four-story club and line was all around and and I was just creating different uh, program and and entertainment and I was so excited and and it was very powerful and become uh, talk of the town. All the newspaper wrote about me and the club and the uh, success of the club. But after four years, I find out that. Uh, Truly, what's happening inside the club is not in my lifestyle, and I like. So, um, you you go from this <laughs> nightclub to you start a successful uh, commercial and interior art and design firm. Uh, I'm curious if I walked up to the Shallow in 1985 or in 1992 <laughs> and said, "There's going to be a woman named Mother Miracle." Uh, who who builds a school in in Rishikesh, India, for impoverished children, and that person's going to be you? What would she say? Oh, I would die laughing so hard. <laughs> Nobody would believe that. Nobody. So, so by the early two thousands, on that note, then when you've made the decision and commitment to to rid yourself of your possessions, when you are moving to India. Um, this is something that would come as a shock to most middle or upper class Iranian families uh, when they realize that you mean it. Uh, how, how did your family react? My father, although he was very wealthy, he never helped me uh, on this path. He said, if you go to Iran, if you help Iranian community, Iranian poor community build this school, I will do whatever you want for you. But I don't know where are you going, who are these Indian people, what guru you're going after or something. He didn't know where, I, where am I going. So he, he never helped me. But after 18 years, now my family believe that, oh, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm sure they're proud of you now. I have a beautiful moment I want to share with you that after... My father saw my perseverance and he keep hearing that I'm expanding and, and my school become very uh, famous in our state and, and people are supporting me financially and uh, he started respecting me more. And uh, I remember the last time I saw him, he was very ill and he was in uh, his bed and I knew that I will never see him again so this was a goodbye when I was saying goodbye he hugged me and he said to me sorry forgive me that I did not believe in you wow and how did that feel uh, that feel very good I thought that this is a one of the most beautiful moments of my life. 
because we all want to have a uh, hear agreement from your father and mother that they love you and they agree with what you do and and to have that feeling always carry in my head that my father is not agreeing with me was like a little burden on me but anyway I was doing it but to hear from his mouth that he said he's sorry and he um, is very proud of me and he loved me very much that was one of the most beautiful moment of my life but Shala, i wonder if it's almost a blessing i mean you did come from this very wealthy family he could have bought you anything you wanted including the school in india it, it, was it almost a blessing that he didn't give you his support for those first years and that you ended up doing this all yourself and in as it turned out, winning his respect that way? Uh, absolutely. I think it was blessing that my father didn't financially help me. And uh, again, I have to stand on my feet and start all over again. And, and I met phenomenal people during this path. And today, all my school is uh, sponsored by uh, generous people around the world. How do you seek the funding, Shahla? Uh, uh, we have a website that uh, people come to our website, read about the story of our children and, and what we are doing and our vision. And then um, they uh, sponsor a child. And that's how every child in our school have a sponsor and uh, this year we add uh, 78 new kids so that's my job to look around and find sponsor for them that's why i'm in yes. the u.s you know um it was interesting when you were mentioning that your your father said uh if you do this in iran i'll, I'll help you um I was going to ask you that question. If you if you would ever decide to do something similar to this or in Iran or if that had had come up. It was not a decision. It was just just my heart broke in India. And Mother India took me in her arms and it never came to my mind. I it never occurred to me to do this in Iran and I think I am where I am supposed to be because it was not a decision you know you know, there's so much that um, it, it's it's almost impossible to go through this whole story without almost feeling like I'm I'm not giving enough respect to to what you've actually been through. You when you first moved to Rishikesh, uh, you you begin to live in a small apartment overlooking the Ganges. You're you're trying to set up this school for the poor. You're a foreigner. You're a single woman who's completely unfamiliar with the local culture without, and you don't really know a lot of people in the area, right? How did you have the confidence to believe you could even do this? It's a very good question, but I just knew. I was just going forward. Just get up every morning and went around and find a bunch of poor kids which live in a plastic shed around us, which is they're everywhere in India. And I just brought those kids and I started teaching them English and my doorbell rings and more poor kids came and everybody find out, oh, there is a woman in uh, neighborhood uh, which she teach English and computer and also give candy and cookies and <laughs> chocolate uh. <laughs> bribery. So anyway, they more kids came to the door and I said, well, I can't fit this many kids. So I rented two rooms and then two rooms become a big compound and I said, well, now I know everything about the schooling, now let's buy. So I had the money in the bank. So whatever property more I had, I sold in U.S. And I asked government of India permission to bring this money and buy the land with my own money and build the school with my own money. And after it took a very long time, but uh, things in India is not easy, but well, perseverance and unconditional love. That was how I built 50,000 square feet uh, four-story school building from kindergarten to class 12. 
How do you make sure that there isn't some kind of cycle of dependency there? How do you um, put the roots down that this can somehow become self-sustaining and and also try and break a cycle of poverty in the village and the larger town and the larger area? What I saw that these children, no matter how much good education we give it to them, eventually they're going to need to go to college and uh, with the same rich guy who put his son or daughter in the same college and of course they will get the job. So um, I came up in 2018 with the idea that why not I start changing my school to a curriculum that I give them two hours a day from kindergarten computer training and uh, make it a unique program and educating our impoverished uh, and uh, children to be the leaders in digital age. So we start giving them cutting edge technology training. That's why our children stand uh, apart from others. They are all uh, wannabe specialists in coding, which is useful in engineers, scientists, artists, designer, data analysis. So I just changed my school to a technology school. It's remarkable what you've done. Let, let me try and zoom out before we end off. Let me ask you how you see the world now. And I know you're not going to, uh, you, you're, you're clearly too modest and too um, respectful a person to, to, to judge others in the middle of an interview, but do you ever look at the way of life in the West after you've seen all that you've seen and, and after you've seen the difference you can make? Do you ever look at the life in the West with all its privileges and comforts and wonder why others do not choose the path that you have? I guess, I mean, can you can you help but be a bit judgmental when you see that poverty up close and know how you changed your life? I um, honestly learned that um, no one has to be judgmental about other people. Everybody are doing what they are supposed to do in this life. And... Many times I convince people to look at my uh, project and help my kids. And when they do that, their life changes. And they always said, helping these kids, they always say that their life has changed joining me. So if I can convince someone to be a part of our project, that person was supposed to be a part of our project. There are people who they listen to me and they just, you know, go on with their life. I don't judge them because they were not supposed to be transformed at this part of their life. You've had such a tremendous impact on people, not just those kids and the staff and their families in India. Uh, I don't even know if you know this. We had a guest on our show a couple months ago, a rising successful actress named uh, Shiva Nagar, who's in L.A., who spoke about, uh, I mean, I guess she's spoken to you. You would know who Shiva is, uh, who spoke about, uh, you changing the way she sees life. She's um, was introduced to Mother Miracle and has since sponsored a child. How do you react when you hear uh, how how you've had that kind of impact on someone? I didn't know she's a, a famous Hollywood star, but uh, I listened to that uh, podcast and I um, uh, find out that she's friend with Shora Abdushlu that. She has also, with her husband, have 12 kids sponsored in our school for from the beginning. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm very surprised and I'm very thankful to Iranian community because every few weeks I see another new Iranian name that sponsored a child. I'm like, wow, hmm. this is amazing that one third of my sponsored are Iranian. A they can sponsor anyone, but they come and sponsor a kid from my school. This is this is I'm honored, you know. I've so enjoyed this conversation. You know, I never asked you how you acquired the nickname Mother Miracle. Where did it come from? It was 2004 that I said, "Well, um, I'm getting a 501c3 in US. I have to have a name." And I said, oh, "I will be a mother." 
And wow, being in India, I, it's going to be a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it goes. <laughs> and and now I know that I'm the mother, and the miracle are these children. Shahla, I, I have to thank you so much for taking this, this time today. One final question. Um, you, you, you dreamt something. You changed your life. You made something quite profound happen, a miracle, as you say, as you might say. What would you say you have learned about the secret to perseverance? Yeah. The secret to perseverance is I always had a vision, even for a club, I had a vision, and I designed it, I draw it, I have it ready, and it just manifested. I had a vision for the school when I was renting two rooms and had children in a street, in a garden, in a yard, everywhere we put cloth, and I knew I have to have perseverance. But those days also, I had the vision. I draw it, I design my school, I close my eyes, I see my school, I see the children running exactly the way it is today. A vision. Uh, that's the key. Uh, Shala uh, uh, I again, <laughs> thank you so much. I look forward to, I, I hope I, I get to meet you in person one day. It will be such an honor. I would actually, uh, I mean, you've, you've sold me on it. I want to come to Rishikesh. I want to see the school. I want to meet these <laughs> incredible kids. Uh, in the meantime, so, I... So honored to come. But believe me, take one-way ticket because you will be sorry if you get your return ticket soon. <laughs> I believe you. I believe you. Thank yeah. you for this today. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be in your podcast. I'm honored to share my story. I hope I can encourage people to do this for anyone else. And I want to add one more thing. I want to say I feel that I'm the happiest person in the world. I get up with excitement. I have lots of things to do, lots of plan and vision for future of my kids. So I'm feel very happy, very enthusiastic, and I want to encourage everyone that take a step, don't scared, don't feel that, oh, what will happen? Phenomenal things will happen. Beautiful people will come. When you are in a path of giving and you don't want anything for yourself in return, the whole doors of miracle open and you, as I found myself in this magical word it will be open to everyone who take a path to uh, giving unconditional love to this poor community anywhere in the world doesn't matter where so i totally encourage everyone to join to do something about these poor people who unfortunate Thank you. Thank you for that gift. Uh, and I, I hope we talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good office. Good office. Shahla Etifal. She's the president and founder of the Mother Miracle Organization. She lives most of her year in Rishikesh, India. And she joined us from San Francisco, California today. And this is full time for Rook for today. Thank you to all you guys out there for supporting and subscribing. Thank you to Arash Beh Zadi for his support on this episode of Rook. Remember, you can find him on Instagram at Arash Piano. You can find us at Rook Media. I want to go out on one of my favorite pieces from the 1990s. Eddie Vedder and Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan, The Long Road. Take care of yourselves. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Mizun Bashin.